Church, how's everybody doing today? Hey, just in case you're new and we haven't met, my name is Tom Brady and I decided to come out of retirement because I think we have at least one more Super Bowl to win. My name's Eric and it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. I'm part of our teaching team here at Journey Church and it's excited to be up here to share God's word with you from the book of Acts. We're going to be studying today on the topic of prayer. And for some of you, prayer might seem a boring topic, but I assure you, as you look at the book of Acts and see what God did in and through believers who committed themselves to prayer, when you start to see the outcomes in your own life and in society as a whole, my hope is that today you are going to get fired up, you're going to say, I don't pray enough no matter how much you pray, and you're going to want to dig in just a little bit deeper. Are you guys okay with that? See, prayer should be the lifeblood of every believer. It's part of our spiritual nutrition, right? It's something that we should be doing as believers. So let me ask you a couple questions as we get started today. Um, Do you want to walk in God's anointing? Some of you didn't say yes. I don't know what's wrong with you people. Do you want to walk in might and power? Do you want to see lives transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life? Amen, amen, and amen then guess what? That will most assuredly only come through time spent on your knees. One of the first books that I read as a new believer, I was graced to read it in maybe the first six months of my Christianity, was a book called He Came to Set the Captives Free by a lady named Dr. Rebecca Brown. It's the story of a woman named Elaine who spent 17 years serving Satan. She was in the occult. She spent her life, and she walked in great power. Mary Jo and I were talking about it. You know, people want to see the supernatural, right? The new age is huge in our generation. People are longing for spiritual things. They're longing to connect, and unfortunately, they're going to a lot of wrong places in order to find that, right? So Elaine found great power in those things. You know there is power in those things? It's just demonic power, the kind of power that you don't want, the kind of power that you should be avoiding. Well, Elaine, through the power of prayer and people discipling her, ended up giving her life to the Lord and spent the rest of her life serving Jesus and walking in his anointing and power and attempting to set others free. Her testimony has been read by thousands. Remember how I told you the story of God continues in our generation? We are Acts 29. Stories continue to be written through our lives. This powerful story was almost too um, crazy to be true. Who could imagine that there's a real battle going on between angels and demons and powers and principalities, and it's taking place here in front of us on earth before our very eyes? Do you believe that today? It's happening, and I've said it before many times, if you don't believe it's happening, that's exactly where the devil wants you to be. He doesn't want you to think that there's a war going on in the heavenlies. He wants you to stay out of the war. He wants you to stay on the sidelines, but as believers, we are called to engage in the battles. C.S. Lewis wrote a series of letters called the Screw Tape Letters, and he wrote them in a very interesting way, as if it was one demon talking to his nephew demon, telling him the kinds of strategies that he should use to keep people in chains, to keep people bound, to keep them from being set free, right? In one of the letters, he writes, the best thing is to keep the patient from the serious intention of praying altogether. He wants you to think prayer is boring. He wants you to avoid time on your knees. He doesn't want you to um, see the wonderful results that come from the times that we spend with our Father in the prayer room through intercession. And I'm here to tell you, God wants to continue to do some great things. The implication of that sentence is that the devil will do all he can do to keep us from using the most powerful weapon of spiritual warfare that we have in our arsenal, which is prayer. Can I get an amen? Amen. As Christians, we can choose to engage in the battle, and guess what? I promise you, you'll see victories on a personal scale, 
as friends and family members come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, as you witness people being delivered from the demonic, as you see people's lives change and transform, or even on a national scale, as Adam was sharing before, some people got on their knees for 50 years before they saw Roe versus Wade overturned. Come on, Jesus, right? I couldn't help but think of that lady who spent the time tarrying in the temple waiting for Jesus to be born. She wanted to see the Lord and Savior. And then she ended up seeing that realized in her life just before going on to be with him for all eternity. I guarantee you there's little old ladies, so to speak. Amen for all of our little old ladies. Hallelujah, Jesus, right? Those prayer warriors, those ones that have engaged year after year to see this victory happen. The question becomes, will you passively sit by and potentially be overrun by the powers of the devil? Will you watch those who that we love get overrun or will we pick up the most potent weapon of our warfare, prayer, and begin to push back on the very gates of hell? Our generation needs us to rise up as intercessors and storm those gates. Father, we thank you and we praise you. As we dive into your word today and look at the book of Acts, we pray that it would come alive in our hearts and minds as if we've never read it before. Would we see things that we never saw before? Would it inspire us as we read these stories of saints who are willing to get on their knees and pray, saints who are willing to fast, saints who are willing to seek you out, and then saw tremendous things happen in their generation? A generation that wasn't so different than ours. A generation that did a lot of crazy things. You entered this world in a time of chaos and we find ourselves at a point of social unrest. A time of change. Will that change go in the direction of the devil or will that change go in the direction of the saints? And Lord, we believe you want to see the victory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. So if you've been here since the start of this series, we've been really building from Acts chapter 2. We've been taking this one little section of scripture and going from there into other places in the book of Acts and drawing from that. So I want to reread that little base set from Acts 2, 42 through 47. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, right? So they were regular church attenders, so to speak, right? They wanted to be where the word of God was being taught. They devoted themselves to fellowship. That means like small groups. Guess why we still do those things in our generation? We have a large gathering of the saints where we could celebrate together. We have these smaller gatherings that meet in our homes and other places where we can continue to fellowship one another and grow in our faith. And to the breaking of bread, they ate a whole bunch of fried chicken dinners. No. No. It did have to do with eating, but it meant also that they were taking communion together, right? Man, go spend time before the altar during these services. Go take communion by yourself or with your family. You don't have to restrict it to here. You could even do it in your own home. Make a habit of that. And to what? About one of you got that. Only one of you is excited about prayer. Bishop, what is wrong with these people? (laughs) To the breaking of bread and prayer. And it says, as a result, everyone was filled with awe. Guess what? There's an outcome when we pray. There's an outcome when we don't pray, right? Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. We'll be preaching about that. They sold property and possessions and gave them to anyone who had need. All the needs of the community were being met. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's the kind of church that we want to be. That's the kind of church that was experienced in the early days of church. And we want to see that continue in our own generation. Um, Adam kind of brought it up a little bit earlier when he was sharing, but I wanted to preface this message for just a second in light of the scriptures that we're reading and in light of the move of God that we see happening here at Journey Church. We've been blessed in this season to really begin to start to see a move of the Holy Spirit. How amazing is that? It's been demonstrated by a pouring out of the Holy Spirit, people speaking in tongues, people with renewed passion for prayer, for evangelism, for a bunch of stuff. We've actually seen people get healed here. Can you give God just a little bit of glory for that? (laughs) Manifestations of the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. 
We've seen legitimate prophetic ministry taking place. Well, at the same time, let's offer up a few cautions. We've been seeing a whole bunch of people saying a whole bunch of prophecy that also we better be a little bit careful of at the same time, right? So in every move of God, not everybody's a prophet, right? Use that carefully. I would offer that up as a restriction. If you're going to go out there saying prophecy stuff, guess what happened to those prophets when they told false prophecies back in the day? They got zapped, did they not, right? So I want to balance some of these amazing things that we're seeing happen with some cautions at the same time, right? See, in the book of Acts, as revival started to break out, something always comes with it that isn't all the way there yet. Notice I said the word yet. What is that? I'll reveal it here in just a moment. It said, if we go back to the verse, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs. When we see those things as charismatic believers, aren't we in awe? Isn't that cool? Isn't that amazing? Lord, don't stop. But even as Adam shared earlier, that song, fill me up, Lord, fill me up, Lord, fill me up, Lord, fill me up, Lord. If that's where it ends, we're in trouble. We're in deep trouble if that's where it ends. Remember, Moses struck a rock and living water came out of that rock. You were meant to be filled up so that you could overflow to go out there and touch others with the love and life of Jesus Christ. That is where true revival begins. Because if you read to the end of that statement in the book of Acts, it said, God added to their numbers daily those who are being saved. And here's the caution that I would give in charismatic churches is that if we get so enthralled with our worship, if we get so enthralled with us being filled up and we don't go out there and start to use it to see people come to know Jesus, there's a real problem. And if we're honest, we haven't seen a ton of salvations yet. Notice I'm using that word yet, right? Where does it start? It starts in prayer as we're going to talk about. But it also goes from prayer to you going out there and inviting other people to come to church. It goes out there to you going to have dinner and lunch with people who are far different than you who don't know Jesus. It goes with having a heart for the unbelievers because heaven and hell lies in the balance. The spiritual battle that I talked about just a moment ago is real. And your friends will really die and go to hell if you don't start to do something about it. So I don't care how full of the Holy Spirit you are, if you ain't going out there and doing something with it, there's something wrong with our faith, right? There's something wrong with our faith. Adam picked on the Baptist and apologized for it a couple weeks ago. (laughs) They don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, right? But they get evangelism, I'll tell you that much. They get evangelism, they go out there relentlessly. You know, Mary Jo and I talked for a moment last night because we use the word indoctrination with some of these, um, you know, different things that are going on in society today that they're trying to indoctrinate our children. Somebody's trying to indoctrinate all children. I'd rather indoctrinate them with the love of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to walk out that kind of lifestyle, right? We need to be bold in our faith, and that's what you see in the lives of these early believers. Man. The desired outcome that we have here is not prophecy or healing or God goosebumps during a worship service. All those things are incredibly good, but if the reality is that heaven and hell lie in the balance, what we really long to see is people get saved. Lest you think I'm crazy and you're mad at me, all you crazy charismatics, come on, Jesus. All you got to do is go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We've been saying that. Fill me up, Lord. Fill me up, Lord. Fill me up, Lord. But why? You will be my witnesses. You will be my evangelists. You will be mine who go out to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Man, some of you need to get all the way out there to like Clay Hill where I live in Jesus' name. You know, you look like you're treating Middleburg like it's Samaria or something. You'd be going around it. You're like, I don't want to go to that place. No, we need to get out there and go into our communities and let them know that Jesus Christ exists, that he is real, and that he is alive. So I want to read some verses from this amazing book of Acts, and we're going to see time after time, prayer happens, the power of God is released, and then God adds to their numbers daily those who are being saved. And as we said in the first message of the series, we're believing God that he will do it again. Lord, would you do it again? 
I want to be more specific. God wants to use you as a witness. Don't say it's somebody else's job. God wants to use you as a witness. He wants to use you to help set the captives free. How exciting is that? Lord, would we always be outward focus? So where does this power come from? It comes from prayer. St. John Christosomthenum of 349 through 407 wrote, Prayer is the root, the fountain, the mother of a thousand blessings. The potency of prayer has subdued the strength of fire. It has bridled the rage of lions. It has extinguished war, appeased the elements, expelled demons, broken the chains of death, expanded the gates of heaven, assuaged diseases, rescued cities from destruction, and arrested the progress of a thunderbolt. It even caused the sun to momentarily stand still. There is power when you pray, and the devil wants to keep you from praying. A few things before I dive into these verses. I want to give you a couple practical takeaways right here from the beginning. If you're new to prayer, they have some pray first guides that I've seen out there in the lobby and at our next step station. They would love to give one of those to you for free. Maybe you could hold that. Up. I think Chris back there, um, hold up one of those guides. If you don't have one, please stop by there and pick up a pray first guide. Um, Barbara Peavy just started on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. right here in the sanctuary, an intercessory prayer group. If you want to learn how to pray and intercede, um, what a great place to start. Go join Barbara. Go join that group. They will teach you what intercessory prayer is all about. Saturday mornings, you guys still meeting at 8 or 8.30? What time is it? 8 o'clock, 8 a.m. right here. Prayer, intercession, live prayer, intercession with Bishop and Adam and other church leaders. You're welcome to come join them. Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Go into the back. Get here early, people. That room is full. I was, I was commenting to Pastor Joey this morning. It's amazing. You know, it started with like four people, and we were meeting in this little room over here on the side, and we were praying and interceding and saying, Lord, would you raise up some people who want to pray? Come on, Jesus, what's going on here? And man, that room now is completely packed when you go back there at 9 a.m. Come join us in prayer. Also, first Thursdays of every month, including July 7th, we're having it right here, a prayer service the first Thursday of every month. So don't tell me they ain't got some times of corporate prayer here at Journey Church. Come on. There is plenty of opportunities. Hopefully one of those or more meets your schedule, but you certainly don't have to confine that to the times of corporate prayer. I would encourage you to make it part of your everyday life. Amen? Amen. You ready to read some scripture? I got a bunch of it for you today because God's word's way better than anything I could say, I assure you that. Listen to these stories. You don't have to go far from Acts chapter 2 and that verse that we just read to see the first thing in Acts chapter 3 starting in verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Come on, y'all. Every day, 3 in the afternoon. How crazy is that? Would we get that kind of a move? Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried into the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those who were entering the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at them, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk, taking him by the right hand. He helped him get up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Could you imagine that kind of anointing? Could you imagine that happening? It can happen. God says in our generation, greater things than these will occur if we'll only get on our knees. Hallelujah. Oh, that we would be captivated by a desire to pray and intercede. Lord, continue to reveal these incredible things to us and let it happen again in our generation. We need a boldness. That's exactly what Peter and John prayed for in the very next chapter, chapter 4. And grant your servants with all boldness that they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. 
You couldn't contain them. When they're filled with the Holy Spirit, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will not be able to contain yourself. You will have to go tell the world about this Jesus who loved you so much that he would die a sinner's death in your place for your sin that you might have life. We owe everything to him. Lord, would you tell the world about him? Hallelujah, Jesus. May this next season of journey be demonstrated not only by the works of his power, but the greatest miracle of all time that we could ever witness is someone giving their life to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Can I get an amen? Amen. As the church began to grow, it became super important to begin to divide up the responsibilities based on giftings. So, So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and to ministry of the word. I want to offer up one uh, comment, though, as you'll see with the example that comes after this. Some may be called to a ministry of prayer and the word uniquely, like a teaching gift, right, Um, where they're praying and interceding as part of their primary job and they're teaching, um, but that does not mean they're any better than the person who's waiting tables. Can I get an amen? Every gift in the body of Christ is important. And as you're going to see in just a second, the guy who works at Carabas in this particular situation ends up doing some very amazing things as a busboy. God does some crazy, crazy stuff in and through his life. But I will say, you know, they say faith without works is dead. You know, being full of the Holy Spirit and sitting here and continuing to get full up, I could say these things now that I'm not the lead pastor anymore. If you're just sitting out there and getting full of the Holy Spirit, you're just getting fat. Come on, Jesus. You need to serve. If you're not serving, if you're not doing the work of the ministry, if you're not out there doing something, eventually your faith is going to become stale. See, I can tell when people are full of the Spirit because, man, you can't keep them from serving. You can't keep them from sharing the gospel. You can't keep them from loving on others. May that kind of spirit manifest itself here in the life of the church. Can I get one more? Amen, amen, and amen. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Therefore, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send workers into the fields. Lord, would you send workers into the field today? How about these table workers? Were they all that important? What impact did they have? Guess who one of those table workers was? A man named Stephen, who was bold in his faith. He started by waiting on tables, but soon found himself preaching against the Pharisees saying words like, you brood of vipers, knowing that he might be stoned, knowing what the consequences of such a statement might be. In fact, it led him in Acts chapter 7 to get stoned. It says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He then fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Man, the Bible's getting exciting here, people. No job too small, no job too great. The busboy waiting on the tables was so powerful in the anointing of the Holy Spirit that he was willing to go confront the leaders of his day that were leading people astray. He was willing to go to them and say, you brood of vipers, you're leading people astray. Jesus is Lord and Savior, and he was willing to get killed for his faith, and he did so in front of a man named Saul who would soon become Paul. And man, this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible because it's so real. You know, Saul was one of the pharisaical leaders of that day, right? He was on a mission to kill Christians. Um, He finds himself sitting at the side, and I could imagine in this particular thing, if you try to make it personal, it says, Lord, would you forgive them of their sins? But what if you translated to him looking in the eyes of Saul at that moment and said, Lord, would you forgive him of his sins? Lord, would you forgive him of his sins? You know what? They were worshiping Saul. They actually took the bloody garments that they were using at that moment, and they came and they laid them at the feet of Saul, and he became the object of their affection. He was the leader of their day. It's like, yeah, we're killing these people at your command at what you're doing. As an act of worship, they laid their clothes, it says, if you go and read it, their bloody clothes at his feet. He gets up from there, and thank God, God forgave him. (laughs) You go read on in the next chapter, and all of a sudden, he's walking down the street, and he goes blind, right? 
And this whole miraculous scene happens where Saul, the Christian killer, is transformed into Paul, the Christian missionary who evangelized both the Jews and the Gentiles and ended up writing two-thirds of the Bible. What might have happened? I'm just throwing this out there. This is not, not 100% biblical. But what would have happened if, if Stephen didn't say that prayer? What if that was the breakthrough prayer? What if that was the one? I don't know which one's the one, but what if that was the one? When he gazed at him, bloody garments at his feet and said, Lord, would you forgive them? Lord, would you forgive them? And that might have been that moment that that prayer just broke through. Think of the power of the word of God at work in your life as you pray these things out and a life becomes transformed as a result. How crazy is that to think about? Holy cow, Lord Jesus. If you move on from there, just a couple more chapters. Paul and Silas, the Paul that I just told you about a minute ago, is miraculously freed from prison. He ends up going out there and he's preaching. And guess what? A riot ensues. I couldn't help but draw the conclusions about what we've witnessed with Roe versus Wade, right? Like people are literally rioting over the fact that they want to keep killing babies. I'm like, something's distorted about that, right? But that's in effect what you were seeing going on. Paul was confronting the sin in their generation. He's out there saying, you know, Jesus is the way. You guys are sinning. You need to repent of your idolatry. You need to repent from the lifestyle that you're living. And uh, they want to drive him out of the city. And a riot ensues. Journey Church, your job is not done until there are riots in the street of Jacksonville for a holy and righteous purpose where you're so bold, you're so out there sharing the good news of the gospel that riots break out and people are trying to drive you out of the city because of your goodness and the message that you're carrying and the anointing that you're walking in. It stirs up the devil. He wants to keep his power. He wants to keep his reign. Think of what happened there. Think of what's happening in our own generation. The story of God continues to be written in our own generation. How about Acts chapter 10, verse 9? About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. If you want to go see this, you could go on my Facebook timeline. I actually commented on this a couple days ago as I was thinking about it and preparing for the message. Uh, Mary Jo and I had the opportunity in the city of Jaffa to go visit the house of Simon the Tanner. This is the exact place where this took place, right? Um, he's there, and what ended up happening at that place? So significant for me. It was the very first place that I was taken to when we went to Israel. We left the airport and the driver took us straight to the house of Simon the Tanner in the city of Jaffa. Um, one, my adopted family name is Jaffe. My original name was not Jaffe. I was adopted at the age of 13, right? So my, or my, or my old identity, my old name was different. It came from a fatherless situation, right? So when my mom got married, he and my dad ended up adopting me. And the Jaffe name comes from Jaffa, so that half of the family is all Jewish. So I was adopted into a Jewish family, right? Well, that very moment, what Peter is praying for is God revealing that the gospel is about to go to the Gentiles, right? Right after that prayer, Cornelius, I think it is, shows up at his door, right? And then he ends up taking him over to pray with them. And then in Caesarea, all of a sudden, gospel breaks out to the Gentiles for the very first time. So in my own life, I'm thinking like, look, I was literally adopted into the family of God called Jaffe. From the city of Jaffa is where that originated. This Jewish family brought me in and invited me in and made me part of their family, right? Just as God invites us as Gentiles into the family of God, by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ, you are part of the family of God. Think of that moment. What if Peter didn't go up there to pray? What if Peter didn't go up there to pray? That moment changed everything for all of us who are in this room. May another riot break out in the name of Jesus Christ. Here's one for those of you who might be falling asleep right now. Like, Eric, will you stop talking? <laughs> Seated in a window was a young man named, you, you, I can't pronounce these names, Eudiclus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. I guess he was running on just a little bit long. We're at 1044. I better finish real quick. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. <laughs> 
So Paul goes down there and he prays for him. Dude wakes back up. Come on, Jesus. So if you fall out, I assure you someone around you will come pray for you. It's going to be absolutely okay in here today. Oh, Lord. But what I want you to see here is that as believers prayed, amazing things happened over and over and over again. Multiple times when God's people prayed, God moved, people got saved, and amazing things happened. Worship team, if you could begin to come back up to the stage. I think one of the coolest things to me is that God's story continues to be.